welcome to the How to Grow Your E-Commerce Business podcast from Vendlab.com. I'm here with Ayat Shakiri, and we're going to talk about conversion rate optimization. So welcome to the podcast. Um, could you Thanks first explain me. to us um, what is conversion rate optimization? So conversion rate essentially measures the percent of vis visitors that actually take an action on your website. So everybody is always looking at that metric, trying to increase it in order for you know, their site to have essentially more revenue and more customers. Um, and we basically work on just improving that, ensuring that more visitors are taking the action, increasing the persuasion on the site, et cetera. So what kind of, so what is the, so what is the key, what are the key metrics you look at? So, yeah, I mean, you don't want to only look at that conversion rate and really the conversion rate fluctuates, of course. And there's so many factors that impact conversion rate. Of course, the level of traffic that's coming to your website impacts the conversion rate. Um, if you're getting junk traffic versus actually targeted traffic, for instance, that's going to impact your conversion rate. So we obviously look at all the steps of the funnel. So I want to make sure that, you know, from the, you know, homepage to uh, the uh, product listing pages to the actual product page that I'm seeing kind of an increase of visitors going from one step to the next, depending on the experiment that I'm going to be running. Uh, so there are so many different, you want to kind of take a look at all of that. You want to look at, of course, page performance, how's the overall site performance, um, you know, site speed, all those, because each one of those is going to impact essentially your conversion rate. So all of those metrics matter to somebody who's doing conversion rate optimization. So do you also look at things like basket size? Of course, we'll look at cart, cart abandonment, um, how, how many visitors are adding, how many products are they adding to the, uh, to the cart. So uh, checkout abandonment, all of those are metrics that are super important for us to kind of understand what is happening and why are the visitors losing confidence at certain stages within the funnel. Because, okay. you know, again, conversion rate optimization is all about like uh, getting the yeses from the visitor. So there's a series of yeses that need to happen. Yes, from like homepage to product page. Yes, from, you know, product page to adding to cart. Yes, from uh, cart to checkout. And we need to kind of maintain that whenever I see that visitors are actually leaving or you know, abandoning at any of those stages, that's super important for me to kind of measure and understand and dig a little bit deeper. Why is that happening? What might be causing the visitor to actually abandon at that point in time? Like why would somebody invest, go to a product page, add it to their cart, and maybe even start the checkout and then abandon? That's very important for me to understand. If I understand that, I can uncover some major issues on the site that could improve the conversion rate and test those out and, and make sure that I'm addressing those particular problems. Okay. So what is, I mean, what is good performance, would you say? I mean, I'd probably, is that, you know, what, what is, what in terms of, let's just pick a, you know, conversion rate, what would you think is a good Yeah, benchmark? I mean, I think like depending on the industry, there's certain averages of, uh, that industries are performing at. But what I've seen that in, in general, anywhere between like a two to 5% conversion rate is, is what I've seen on average. Decent. Of course, on the higher end, you know, you have like, you know, the 10 and 15 percent conversion rates, which is what everybody is really trying to get to. You're trying to get to that 10 to 15 percent. How can I ensure that, you know, my customers are going to trust in my brand and not go to like an Amazon and get something similar to what I'm offering? Right. You want to make sure that you're keeping them um, and and increasing kind of like that loyalty right inside them that to, to kind of keep them engaged on your site versus going somewhere else and just looking at you as a comparison with, with another brand. You don't want so, them to compare you to another brand. So is it, I mean, is, is, I mean, you know, if a site has already got, so say 3% conversion, right. So respectable, is it something that, you know, I mean, this is a bit of a, how long is a piece of string question, but would it be, you know, achievable to the, should they aspire to, to guess, you know, like, 7% conversion or is it just one of those things where, you know, it's just probably not going to happen. Uh, I, it is. Look at there's, a, like I said, conversion rate, it's a, a metric that's a little bit difficult sometimes to measure because there's so many different factors and it's a range. Usually the conversion rates a range. It goes up and down, you know, throughout your, the, the, the month. However, what we do is in order to help our customers understand, okay, like what is the actual improvement that any type of optimization is going to do? We call it a return on change, not a return on investment, because I'm making a specific change to your site. I'm testing it. I'm using A-B testing yeah. software to actually test it, to show you right now in the now, what is the actual impact that my change had on your particular website? 
And that's important because again, you know, because of all of the different factors, economy, your customers are, your, your competitors are running some sort of like, you know, a sale. There's so many different factors. You need to always be changing and improving on the current, whatever is currently your site. You're always kind of measuring against that. So my current, you know, conversion rate uh, is whatever it is. And I'm showing that particular improvement in this particular uh, time. That's why so it's so you, important to do the testing because it helps you at least understand what type of an impact the program is having on your on your site in order for you to see like okay I made this change what type of an impact did it have? So do you have to because I mean in my experience with e-commerce sites is they do this in terms of you know sales right and therefore yeah. how do you know that the change you've made is statistically significant? What kind of do you have to have quite a lot of traffic come into it or? Well, yeah, I mean, so if you're gonna run any type of a testing program, like if I'm going to actually, you know, do my research, find a problem, try to solve it and implement an A-B test experiment, I do need to have enough traffic in order to validate. So I need to get to a certain sample size in order for it to become a statistically valid experiment. Um, so if you have lower traffic in general, sometimes that means that you can, you have to run your experiment for maybe three weeks or perhaps yeah. four weeks in order for you to t see a statistically significant result. But how do we get around that? There are a couple things that we do. One number one thing that we do is we'll also measure some of the sub goals. Like I said, I don't want to necessarily measure always the ultimate conversion, like just like a purchase. I might want to look at how many visitors this particular problem is on, for example, the product page. I want to see how many visitors made it from the product page to the cart page. I want to increase that rate because by default, if I increase that rate, I'm going to increase the overall conversions on my website. Sometimes, of course, you know, you can still add other other measurements, but nonetheless, looking at those sub goals and those secondary goals helps me kind of determine the validity and the impact of my particular experiment. The other way to do this is there's something called sequential testing. And when you're doing sequential testing, that's giving you more of a predictor of if you run this experiment for three weeks, you're going to see X, Y, Z results. And that helps smaller sites that don't have a lot of traffic predict what type of an impact this experiment is going to have. Is it going to win or is it going to lose? Mm -hmm. And that way, again, you know, for, for smaller websites, it makes it possible to actually do A-B testing in a successful manner and be able to get the results that they're looking for and improve on their site all the time. You're always improving against your control. So do you find that, I mean, because, you know, when I first started in e-commerce, right, everyone, people were all building their own sites and, and you know, doing their own themes and stuff. And now it's very templated. You know, yeah. there's, there's, relatively speaking, far less customization on something like a Shopify site than there was kind of 15 years ago. Right. And the sites look all much more similar than they used to, mainly because of the, 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 the different devices. Has that made your, you know, work easier or is there less demand for your work or is it, is it made the whole thing easier because you can make changes easier? Um, I mean, in, in some ways it's made things easier, obviously like working with a platform like Shopify is not like working with like a Magento or a custom build. <laughs> so yeah. certainly from a development perspective, uh, it's made some things a little bit easier, but I, I agree with you. There's like a, a monotony of, of, of just, you know, very sameness across like the industry. You go to like, you know, one website looks literally, if you just hide the actual, brand it looks everything looks the same because they probably use the same theme <laughs> exactly exactly so how do you you really need to figure out ways to distinguish and that's that's where the challenge for us comes is like okay well you know true you know you want to kind of be uh it make e things easier for visitors now when there's some things are usually the same it makes things easier for the visitor because they're used to it a visitor will come in they know exactly how to navigate they know exactly where to go they know exactly like you know how to, to look at a page but what happens is when you don't do something a little bit different, then you're not really drawing their attention. You're not engaging them. You're not really um, helping your brand resonate with them in a different way. Because that's the key thing is that all these smaller websites, they're competing against larger brands. They're competing against the Amazons of the world that, you know, a lot of times visitors are just tend to go there because it's easier. It's, you know, all this, all this, right? So how do I compete against that? I need to make sure that my brand sticks out. I need to draw their attention in a different way, which means that my site design needs to be a little bit different to engage them. It needs to break up that monotony. Uh, the brand needs to enhance the trust and confidence in the visitor in some way, shape or form. So there's a lot of aspects that we have to kind of work on to really highlight the brand 
that, you know, sometimes these templates make it a little bit more difficult to do. Okay. So what process do you go through to, to you, you know, to find that, you know, from start to finish, someone engages you to find a usability, you know, to improve the usability of their site? And also, what, you know, also what, what, what process do you go through? And what could someone, if they want to do it themselves or start off the process, what process should they go through? So our methodology is very similar across the board. I think any type of conversion rate optimization methodology follows something similar. Our methodology is specifically called SHIP. It's easy to remember. Um, and SHIP stands for scrutinize, hypothesize, implement, and propagate. And in the scrutinize phase, that's where you do a lot of your research. Um, and, and what I always say is that, you know, of course, I do a lot of the bulk of my research at the beginning of the project, but the research continues throughout. It never ends, right? And, and the experimentation piece is part of the research as well. So within the scrutinized phase, we'll be doing, you know, obviously analytics, audit, and, and research to ensure that, you know, everything is working properly, A, within the analytics platform. Uh, and then also look at some key metrics within analytics. So how are the pages performing? How, you know, where are the major traffic sources? Um, understand a little bit more about those sources of traffic because I need to understand the ads that are actually bringing the visitors to the site. What pages are they landing on? That's Those are all really, really important pieces of information that are going to help me uncover different problems that could potentially be stopping visitors from moving forward uh, with a purchase. Uh, we also conduct customer interviews and we, specific, we follow a specific methodology called jobs to be done. Again, jobs to be done refers to trying to understand really that progress, the social emotional progress that made the visitor make, make the decision, right? Like why did they make this decision? There's always some sort of social and emotional reason behind somebody making a decision. For example, we used to sell, we used to help a, a e-commerce website that sold uh, truck um, organizers, you know, in, within the, for their truck beds. And, uh, and when we interviewed customers, we had multiple customers that mentioned about their family or about their dog and they wanted to increase like kind of like the room and space within their own truck in order for them to do other activities within their family. So highlighting some of that information on the site and talking about how now your truck is free and you have like more space to do more family activities and whatnot really enhance the overall conversion on the site. It was really touching on an emotional aspect that people were feeling and, you know, engaged them in a different way and, and motivated them to actually make a purchase. So again, that, you know, customer interview process is really important and integral to us understanding the users in a different way and understanding those emotional social aspects. And I'm when I'm conducting these interviews, I'm highlighting what are the different problems that are potential that we can experiment, you know, find different solutions on the site uh, as a result of. Um, we also launch heat maps, session recordings. So this is all within the scrutinized phase. I'm really trying to understand. I'm doing also a, com a competitor audit to understand, you know, what are those different competitors out there and how can I really address some of the, the different aspects, you know, and, and counter what they're doing. I want to be different than, than the, the competitors, of course. Um, and then once we've we have this list of different problems, we prioritize, we have a prioritization sheet. Again, those are really accessible online. You can find them anywhere. You plug in all the different problem areas and then it gives you a priority. Like this is what you should be focusing on first. Because again, you know, you could come up with like a lot of different problems, but what do I do first? I want to make sure, especially when I'm a small company and I have limited resources, I want to make sure that I'm addressing the major issues on my website. So it prioritizes for you. What are those first things that you need to tackle on your site in order to really improve the conversion rates? And then, um, and then you build the experiment. So there's a lot of different testing software out there. We use uh, FigPy. It's actually a sister company at, uh, for Invesp. Um, but uh, we also were pretty agnostic. We'll use VWO. We'll use uh, Optimizely. So there's different platforms that you can utilize, and they all vary in, in price and whatnot. Um, FigPy, you know, tends to be a little bit more reasonable in price and has the heat map session recording, polling, all of that within uh, the mm -hmm. same platform. Anyhow, so we will build the experiment and we'll launch it and then we measure, hey, how did this actually perform? Like I prioritize what the different problems are, taking that top problem, what did it have? What type of an impact it had? And sometimes we'll have like 10, 15, 20, 30 percent increase in conversion rate as a result of that experiment. And remember, like, you know, I'm measuring usually on a single page, like I might be measuring my first experiment on the product page or maybe just on the cart page. But it'll be the conversion rate that it's measuring is for that particular page um, and that particular page's performance. But um, 
uh, and then we collect the data. So once the experiment has run, there's now another opportunity for me to understand a little bit more about the visitors and you know how they're performing. How do they react to this particular change? What does that mean? Are there other experiments? Like, can I iterate on this particular experiment based on the results that I see? When it's a losing experiment, it's not something to be upset about either because there's a lot of information that I can gather. I need to pivot. I need to understand, okay, well, why did the visitors not react you know, positively to this particular change? What can I do differently? Um, so there's a lot of opportunity there to run you know, other experiments based on, on the results of, of a losing experiment. So that's okay. kind of the, the program in a nutshell. So, what do you? What are the common conversion issues? Common conversion issues you see. So, one of the big common conversion issues is the lack of continuity between an ad and the landing page. So, okay. you know, and it, so basically, you'll have something you're promoting, something you're saying, something within the ad, and then they get to the the actual landing page, and it's something completely different or the language is not, you know, similar. So the visitor is losing that continuity and they might lose confidence as a result of that and bounce. So it's very important to make sure that I'm aware of what they're seeing in the ad and I'm I'm complementing that within the landing page in order for me to, you know, enhance the overall conversion, keep them engaged, keep them on that page. Otherwise they're going to bounce very quickly if they don't see what they were seeing and experiencing on the ad. That's kind of like one of the number one things. Um, number two, which I think a lot of e-commerce websites hear and see, but just, you know, like making sure that the actions are clear and, uh, visible above the fold. Um, so I'm always still very surprised by sites that, you know, on a, like a mobile device or even on desktop where the add to cart is buried at the end of the page. Why would I do that? I need to just make sure that it's on the top of the page in order for the visitor to see it. You also want to see like what are the important pieces of information that the visitor needs to see immediately in order for them to take an action. Like don't try to do a lot, just try to prioritize and, and figure out what's the primary goal that I have on a particular page. Don't try to do so many different things. Like, you know, for instance, especially with landing pages, this happens where I find a lot of um, clients try to do a lot. They, they try to have so many different goals. Oh, if you want to see this, if you want to see that, if you want to you know, go to this, if you want to go to that. There's no reason like the visitor is coming for a specific reason. Make sure that primary goal is clear. And if you want below the fold to have other things, it's fine. But just make sure that the top page is clear and they know exactly what to do and what to expect in the next stage. Um, so those are kind of like some of the, the common things that I find, uh, you know, just trust in general. I find a lot of sites underestimate how many visitors need that trust and confidence. So for example, you know, if I have like press mentions, if I have reviews, if I have, um, you know, all this kind of these types of uh, elements that are going to enhance trust, I want to make sure that they're visible to the visitor. Uh, sometimes, you know, on the homepage, I want to repeat it in different pages in order for them to kind of really feel like, okay, this company is legit, especially if you're a smaller brand, like you have to know, people want to know that I'm, actually working with a legitimate company and not, you know, a random company that's just going to take my money. Um, so those are kind of some things that I would, I would uh, look out for. Okay. So what do you think are the most important bits of the site to optimize? So, I mean, just in the kind of basics, is it the, the images, the copy you were talking about reviews? I mean, what are your, what are your, and, and the price, right? What are you, okay, let's go through these things. Images. What do you think about images? Is that, because people don't read text anymore, they just see images. Right, exactly. So I think you do need to make sure that you have a lot of images on your website, but you have to make sure that those images are optimized because what happens to images, they drag down the performance of the site as well. So so you solve a problem by having a more engaging site, but then you have like a, a site speed problem. So <laughs> you need to just be careful on how you do the implementation in general. Um, so for instance, we had a client that sold uh, you know shades and blinds for, for Windows. And uh, their site was just like very, very copy heavy. So we did a whole redesign for their website. Um, and the way that we did the redesign, we actually did it page by page rather than just doing a full out redesign just to see an, the impact. So we first did homepage um, and we saw a really great performance. And then we did went on to the different pages throughout the site and we did them page by page. But, you know, again, we, we revamped the site with lots of images and very little copy. Now, of course, the biggest issue that you're going to run into is people say, well, you know, I have the copy for SEO purposes. If that's the reason, you just have to figure out ways. There are different ways that you can hide some of that copy so that it's not so prominent. Um, and, 
either at the bottom of the page or for example, collapsing some of the copies so that again, it doesn't take up so much space on the page because again, visitors don't typically read. And if it's just for SEO purposes, you just want to make sure that you're hiding it in a way and you're, you know, engaging the visitor with the, the images rather than, than a lot of SEO copy. So what do you think? Okay. That's interesting. What about copy? I mean, what do you think is the best way of, you know, what is, you know, cause I think in you know, these days, you know, in a way copy gets a, a you know, is, is, ignored and people just write you know just cut and paste what they've got from the manufacturer what is what would you say is something in copy that really sells something so um what we've found is when we've conducted these jtvd interviews is that we take sometimes the words of the actual customer and utilize that within the copy and the headlines throughout the site um, we've found a lot of you know just in general we found that that's successful because this is the, what the customers are feeling uh, so when you're able to communicate it in the terms and in the words that your customers have, you're really going to see a lot more success. Now, again, I'm not taking exactly how they're saying it, but I'm wordsmithing it and I'm taking kind of like the essence and the meaning of whatever it is that they're saying. And I'm uh, kind of utilizing that and leveraging that on the site. Okay. So how would you do that in terms of you, if I had a, if I had a teddy bear or something like that, you'd say, or you'd ask people what they like in a teddy bear and then you would pull out those points in the copy. Right. Remember, you know, when we're conducting our interviews, we're always looking for the social and emotional reasons in particular. Um, so like, what, what does it make you feel? What does it make you, you know, like, why do you want, depending on like, you know, again, like that social aspect, like, what is it? Why is that important to you? And like, why do you want this teddy bear, for example? So those are the things that we're trying to pull out those emotional and social aspects that are really able to, like I, I mentioned the, the tuck, truck bed example, the copy that we're utilizing are, you know, like, again, the emotional and social aspects that they're mentioning about, you know, wanting to be with their family and like spending more time with their family and going camping with their family. Mentioning these types of things in their words on the site really resonates with what we found, at least resonates a lot with the rest of the customers. Okay. So what about um, price? Is that, I mean, once you've got someone on the site, does it not that matter that much or? It... Well, price, of course, does matter, you know, and but it shouldn't be the deciding factor, right? Like that's the key thing is that you need to engage them and persuade them on, with what the product is and the brand before you're, sh you know, shocking them with the <laughs> with the actual price. So we have a, a client that sells um, a sleepwear, but the sleepwear is, is pricey. It's expensive. However, what they do is, again, like what we've worked on is really enhancing the overall brand, you know, like what what's so special about this brand, right? You know, it it's like you're gifting yourself, um, the comfort levels that you're feeling with this particular uh, fabric. Um, so all these, you know, like aspects that we're really enhancing before we're showing them what the actual price is in order for the visitor to be engaged and convinced that hey, this is like I'm treating myself. And that's essentially like, again, going back to the interviews, what we found a lot of people and why they've selected the brand was because, again, they feel like it is a treat for themselves. Um, so that's what we're trying to really resonate with the visitor when they're coming. Like, treat yourself. This is something like, you know, you're special. You deserve this. Um, this really amazing, you know, like, you know, fabric and print that you're not going to find anywhere else. It's unique to you that's kind of the the brand image that we're really selling before they actually see the price. And so once they get to the price, again, they're going to still have that consideration, but it's not going to be as strong as, for example, you know, like uh, without seeing kind of all that brand reassurance that we've done before to kind of really prime them and prep them to see the price. So that's the key thing is that you just want to make sure that you're you know, honing in on on what makes your brand and your product unique and special to the visitor, that unique value proposition that's really going to get them to move forward and convince them because, you know, price then becomes a consideration, but not as strong as a, of a consideration. Okay. But we, so, have okay, done, we're gonna... we have done price testing, like, you know, meaning that if a, a client, for example, wanted to see like what type of an impact certain pricing has on their site if it's a little bit lower if it's a little bit higher we have done uh campaigns like that just to understand a little bit more so you know for sure you should do some sort of price testing if you're not sure whether or not your prices are going to 
to work for your visitors. But again, like don't make the your focus always on just the the price. You sh there should be so many other aspects that you're enhancing throughout your site before you worry about your price. Okay, so I'm going to take you through a customer journey, right, all the way from clicking on a clicking on a Google Shopping ad through to through to the thank you page, right? So okay, Google Shopping ads from a kind of conversion rate point of view. What are your what's your advice? Well, you know, again, so I, I'm not, I don't usually optimize the ads. I'm yeah. optimizing once they get to the landing page. So what my advice would be on that particular landing page is making sure that, okay, well, whatever I have is matching whatever it is that they're seeing. Um, so uh, ensuring that I have, again, you know, like a, a headline that's matching, you know, the whatever description, an image that they're seeing that they're going to see on the actual um, landing page. Uh, and then also, again, like, you know, some of the, something similar to what I've just said about enhancing the brand. I'm getting somebody who's who's new mm -hmm. to the brand completely. I want to make sure that I'm selling them on what makes this brand unique and why they shouldn't go anywhere else. That's okay. very, very important to happen on that landing page. OK, so that's important. OK, so what else on the landing page they take it to a product page? What are your top tips on a product page? So product page, again, you want to make sure that add to cart is uh, above the fold. I always like to add particular trust elements um, below the um, add to cart. Like, for example, if you offer free shipping or if you have a really great return policy or if you um, have, uh, you know, certain aspects that are, uh, you know, like just a, a great like product, I guess, um, benefits, I would kind of list those in a way that the visitor can kind of see and engage and scan very quickly. I want to make sure my reviews are are uh, above the fold as well. And so you think the reviews and, are very important? Like you'd recommend a review, some sort of review app? I, I definitely recommend reviews. I mean, you know, people are always concerned that you're going to get some, some uh, negative reviews, but negative reviews sometimes... Again, it depends on how severe the negative reviews are, but they could be positive because like, you know, again, if I read a negative review and I see that, oh, like this doesn't really matter to me, like it's, it's talking about something that doesn't necessarily impact me, then I might move forward with the purchase as a result. So I wouldn't be afraid of negative reviews and I would just, you know, lay it out for visitors. It really enhances trust and confidence in people when they see, when they see negative reviews that tells them that these aren't just fake. These are actual reviews from customers because people are very um, nowadays, people are, are always when they're looking at reviews, they're looking at it with a grain of salt because they're like, oh, you know, probably the company has just chosen like the very positive things. They're not telling me everything. That's why negative reviews counter that. Um, so don't be afraid of negative reviews. Of course, I mean, I would tell you if like it's very severe, then you need to kind of figure out why that's happening. But but nonetheless, you know, the, yeah, have those like negative reviews. that's important. What's your opinion about shipping? Do you think free shipping or not free shipping? Uh, everybody I'm free shipping, by the way. Listen, customers <laughs> love freebies. Love, customers love freebies. And we're in a world where we're competing against like, you know, like Amazon, which has made it a standard to have free shipping. So um, if you can offer it and uh, increase your margins on your, on your, like, or the pricing on your products, you know, I, that's usually what I would recommend for, for uh, customers, because again, people love it. If you can't offer free shipping, offer free shipping with a certain amount. Like for example, if they exceed a hundred dollars or, you know, $150. Um, so you can increase your average order value in that way. And, and at the same time also offer them something that they always look forward to. Okay. So we've gone for the, okay. So right now, so they, they, what about the product page? You're saying that the, 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 the add to cart needs to be above the fold. Right. Um, uh, description needs to be also, you know, like visible for the visitor to see. You want to make sure that you optimize those descriptions. Don't have like, you know, like a um, just a standard, especially if you don't have many SKUs and you can control that. Um, try to just make sure that that description is, is engaging enough for the visitor. We, typically, what we like to do is we like to like bullet things or add like, you know, specific, you know, benefits and whatnot. It's easier for people to scan that way. Yeah. Uh, remember, people are scanning, they're using their mobile devices, they want to look quickly, they don't want to have to like read like this big, like, you know, paragraph, and um, they don't want to like a factory, you know, like description, they want something that, you know, s shows that you care about the brand, and that you've put time into it. Um, so I would I would work on on making sure that that's always whenever you're creating those descriptions, there's always somebody there, a copywriter that's working on it to ensure that you're engaging the visitor with why, how, why this product is special. Okay. So, right. So now they, they've, they've added to the cart. What about the cart page? 
Um, the cart page, you want to make sure, again, like this is the point where they're going to move into actually giving you some personal information. So you want to make sure that there's like trust and confidence uh, elements. So like, you know, for example, um, any type of badges that give them the, the, the sense that this is a secure site is helpful. Um, making sure that there aren't any like hidden fees or anything that they're going to be surprised about. All of that, you know, is like, you know, clarified and there's nothing for, for the visitor to be concerned about. Oh. Um, uh, and you want to make sure again, like the product information is all listed in like your order summary is very clear. Like in, in general, what I would say is less is more generally in e-commerce, less is more. Uh, when you have clutter on your site, it causes visitors to have just anxiety and feel like, you know, perhaps they're not, you know, this is not a trustworthy uh, site. So just make sure that you you have a clean cart, uh, simple, and make sure you add, again, those trust elements. I We've even tested with adding customer reviews on cart pages, and we've seen really great success. Again, I wouldn't just copy a specific idea. I would test it to make sure that it actually works for your site because every site is different. Okay. Um, right. So we've got the cars. Um, they've gone for the car. What about the checkout page? Um, so within the checkout page, I would just make sure that, again, it's uh, organized. You know, again, I would always add a progress bar so visitors know like how many steps it takes for them to complete the actual uh, checkout. That's always helpful for them just to have that visual. Some uh, out of the box, I, I think Shopify has like some sort of like a progress bar. So yeah, it's and it's. I don't think you can optimize uh, Shopify's checkout. Yeah, you so. can't. You can't. Not on. I think you can add on Shopify Plus. I think you can add text. But Maybe you can add some things there, but. Um, I would just make sure again, like, you know, that the, uh, uh, especially when they're entering their, um, their financial information, their credit card information, all of that area seems like easy for the visitor. You have multiple ways that they can actually pay for the product. And what, what payment, helpful. what payment method are you, uh, how many payment methods do you think PayPal is important? Um, uh, it, depending on the, the site, but I found in general, whenever our, our clients have included PayPal, it's uh, helped increase. What about whenever other payments? Yeah, PayPal and also like any type of um, uh, service that allows for installments is also helpful okay. for visitors, depending again on the price of your products in general. Okay, so a Klarna, don't we have in the States? A Klarna or like a firm or, I mean, even PayPal has like, you know, installments. So, you know, there, there are different options there, but it's just helpful to give visitors options. Okay, right. So they've gone through the checkout. Have you got any advice about a kind of a thank you page or anything like that? Um, I mean, I, my advice would be just make sure that you give them the information that they need. You send the email, the confirmation email in a, in a way, and you always remind them of their, um, purchase. So like, you know, depending on like wh whatever stage it's at. So they get the confirmation email and the thank you page. Uh, but then they also then see like, you know, like an update on their particular product, because again, visitors, especially when they're working with a brand that they're not familiar with, they're anxious. They want to know like, where's my product and when is it going to get shipped and all that good stuff. So giving that information is super important. Okay. So, I mean, obviously Shopify does a really good job because sometimes they show you like, even like where your product is right now and when it's going to get to you. But, um, if you're not on Shopify, just make sure you provide that information through um, email if you can't do it on the thank you page. Okay. So if you had one thing, or maybe three things, start off with one. What's the top thing? If you had one thing you had to look at on your site, what would you recommend? Uh, like, what do you mean in terms of, like, data? Well, if there's the first thing, what's the first thing you'd look at? If you had, if you had, if you got, you know, if you, if you, what you think is the, be, you know, the, the biggest win that you think people should just, you know, today they should, they have to pick one thing to look at. Oh, man. Check. One thing that they should. It could be three at. if you like. We'll do three. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't, if you're, if you can't do one. Um, I would look at, of course, and I'm sure people in, t in general have a, a, a close eye on this, although I've always been surprised by some of our clients, but like in general, you want to see like, you know, your, the performance on different sources of traffic, like how is that performance and what's happening there? Um, because that's going to tell me a little bit about how, what I need to do on those particular landing pages. Cause landing pages are really important. That's where, again, what traffic is, is entering from. So I want to enhance that overall experience. Um, I would also, I think, you know, sometimes we have like quick experiments and quick wins that we implement on our client sites. And 
a lot of it is centered around, for example, on um, throughout the pages, whether it's homepage, whether it's, you know, the product listing pages or the product pages or even the cart page, just making sure that there are elements that are going to enhance the trust and confidence on the, the site. So that's, those are quick wins typically, you know, whether it's making sure that there's, you know, clear customer reviews, like actual like words with the reviews and the name of the customer on the site or like, you know, press mentions or again, like those um, trust elements, uh, like the badges, if you have like, you know, for example, like a um, shopper approved badge or something along those lines, those typically are quick wins that just enhance the overall trust and confidence in the visitor. Um, and then uh, the next thing I would just make sure that all of my, you know, like I, I, when we're ever we're scanning a site, if we see like a site where like the add to cart's a little funky or it's below the fold, Again, it's usually a quick win to make sure that that's easy and more visible above the fold. Okay, cool. Jenna, I think you've con conclusively proved that you know your stuff about conversion rates. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'd like to ask a fluffy question at the end. What is, what's inspired you recently? You, can you give us any tips for anything we should check out? Um, well, recently I've been really inspired by some of the, um, students in these, uh, encampments standing up for what they believe. I just, I feel, I find that very, very inspiring. And I, you know, it's just one of those things where you feel like, okay, the, the, the kids are okay kind of thing. Um, so that's been just really inspiring. It's not particularly, I guess, fluffy in the sense that it's a little oh, bit more right. contentious, <laughs> but, but certainly just seeing that they, um, they stand up for what they believe is, is inspiring. Excellent. That's good. Kids are all right. Yes. The kids are all right. <laughs> <It's now>. all right. <laughs> where can we, where can we find you online if people need to check you out? Uh, you can find us on, on the site, investcro.com or, um, I'm on Instagram, defrant underscore marketing and uh and on linkedin and uh, of course on twitter at just my first name at ayat um and um so you've got four just a y conversion optimization is right behind me actually this book over here conversion optimization the art and science of converting prospects into customers um published by o'reilly i mean it's it's an older book we published it in 2009 but it is still mostly still relevant Mostly relevant, hasn't changed there's that a lot much. of things that have changed <laughs> since then. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Okay. <laughs> cool. Love to speak to you and um, uh, good luck for the future. Thank you very much. Really nice to speak to you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. My cursor. Stop. <laughs>